actually going to be talking about multiple packages as we go along. Um, but what we're in doing this, what we're going to be able to do is do some of the background information just once, and then we'll talk about individual packages, in particular things like Moab and Pumi and, and, uh, and Albany and some other tools along the way. Um, also, a little bit on like some of the other discussions, because we're talking about a variety of different methods and, and techniques and tools, this is going to be much more of an overview of the capabilities and the goals of the tools as opposed to any of the details on how to use them. Um, hopefully some of that can be picked up in the hands-on sessions or to go to the appropriate web pages and follow up uh, at, a later, at later times. Or, and to, of course, contact us during the presentation, during the next couple of days or afterwards. So the unstructured meshing technology development team associated with FastMath comes from a variety of organizations, from Argonne National Labs, Lawrence Livermore, Sandia National Labs, RPI, as well as University of Colorado. Um, so it's, it's a fairly large team, and I'm not going to go into the, uh, what she, each of the groups is doing in detail. Some of that may become a little bit more evident. So unstructured meshing methods, uh, there, we need these tools, these unstructured meshing techniques and methods to support the developers of unstructured analysis code. So until we get near the end of today's discussion, there will be no real discussion of the solver technologies or discretization technologies associated with the unstructured meshes. These are going to be infrastructure tools to support the execution of those simulations and their entire workflows on massively parallel computers. So what are the core components that we will be talking about? Well, there's parallel mesh infrastructures. How do you deal with supporting a large mesh? You know, for example, we'll see meshes as large as 92 billion elements spread over three-quarter million cores. How do we support just the representation of that, the interactions of those, the migration of those? How do we generate such meshes? How do we adapt those meshes? How do we optimize the quality of those meshes? How do we support the information associated with the solution in, uh, of parameters on those meshes? And how do we coordinate their uh, transfer from one mesh to another or as the mesh is adapting? Also core within this process is the fact that we're going to be talking about taking advantage of the ease with which unstructured meshing techniques can perform very general adaptations of the mesh, changes to the mesh. And if we're going to be doing that, we need dynamic load balancing. Also point out, we simply need dynamic load balancing as we may go uh, in a multi-physics analysis because different solvers have different needs as to what's necessary to be load balanced for the, the maximum scalability and performance of those methods. We will talk a bit about some of the developments of unstructured uh, solver uh, mesh interactions, but focusing on their coordination is mo more than the specifics of the solvers. We'll talk about how we've used some of these tools to support a variety of existing uh, unstructured analysis codes in the, con in the performance of adaptive analyses um, and talk about a specific environment that's being developed at Sandia National Labs in collaboration with uh, other groups such uh, um, and there'll be an introduction to what will be covered in the unstructured mesh hands-on session which is tomorrow. So what is an unstructured uh, mesh? It's a spatial uh, dis uh, discretization composed of topological energies in which we have very general connectivities and shapes of those. What are the advantages of the unstructured meshing methods? Well, for one thing, we have the ability and tools and technologies to go from very complex geometries to controlled meshes at the press of a button. And that is part, an important part of the simulation workflow, at least in my opinion. If I'm going to generate a multi-billion element mesh, I don't want to spend three weeks generating the mesh to spend only five hours doing the analysis. I want to press the button and get a mesh. Yeah, maybe I'll adapt it and spend a little bit more time in the analysis, 
but I don't really want to deal with laying out elements or breaking up geometry. Um, so they, they and they can fi when used properly, they can be highly effective solutions in that they can fit to the geometry. They can account for anisotropy associated with the physics of the solution that can be also influenced by the domain and the curvatures of the domain. Um, you know, and as I mentioned, given a complete geometric representation, we can do this in an entirely automatic fashion. We can adapt. So what are the disadvantages? Well, it's certainly a more complex set of data structures than you're going to see for uh, unstructured meshes. They're larger, they're harder to work with, and that's part of the reason we're in business, creating these parallel infrastructures for those that want to develop their analysis packages. Because within the analysis package, you need a very simplified representation. But if we're going to do mesh generation, mesh adaptation, we need much more, more richer representations and the association of those representations with the geometry of the, of the model that we're making the meshes of. Um, they can provide the highest degree of, uh, of accuracy per degree of freedom, but that requires very careful control. And they are more expensive on a per degree of freedom basis, certainly, than an unstructured meshing method. So you have to you know, control the quality of the elements. Uh, you have to make sure your gradations and layouts and your anisotropy is well matched to your problems to gain all these advantages. So the goal of the fast math on structured meshing developments, including providing component-based tools, tools that can be picked up by developers of analysis capabilities, that, so they can take full advantage on structured meshing methods, are easily used by and, and be easily used by these analysis code developers. We want to develop those components to operate through multiple levels of APIs uh, that increase interoperability and ease of integration. And what do I mean by multi-level? I'm going to make it simple. I'm going to talk about it sort of at two levels. The one level where you're going to want to interact with the mesh components, uh, the individual mesh entities and their, their adjacencies and interactions one at a time or at a very fine level. And a higher level, if I'm doing an adaptive analysis and I don't necessarily want to see the details of the mesh, but I know how I want to change the mesh and can specify that by simply saying how, what I want a mesh size field to be, that's another level of interaction. And we support those, ty those types of levels of interactions. We do work very closely with DOE and, in fact, other application areas on integrating these technologies. So this list here, which I'm not going to enumerate, uh, we'll run out of time if I go through the details on all these slides, is a list of some of the application areas. What I do want to point out is that there's a mix of finite element methods there. There's uh, of both continuous, discontinuous, Galerk, and low order finite element methods on linear elements, high order finite element methods on curvilinear elements, uh, finite volume techniques of a variety of different types. Um, and uh, combinations of particle and continuum method applications that are supported. So these are being used quite heavily in a wide variety of applications. And if you will, that, the, the, the list of these codes indicated here, these are almost exclusively codes that were developed independently with no knowledge of our infrastructure. So it's not something where they had to buy into our framework and our data structures. It's by using these interfaces and APIs, they can work, we can work with them. Now, in some of the cases, as we've integrated things more tightly, things have been borrowed back and forth to make them more efficient, but it, uh, that's almost never our starting point. So what do we mean by a parallel mesh infrastructure? Well, we need to have the mesh distributed across the nodes, across the cores on the nodes, to the accelerators on the nodes as, as that goes forward and to, to deal with that. We need base parallel functions such as how do we partition the mesh and control it as the mesh may be changing and the partitions may be changing. Uh, support ghosting, there was, the, uh, ghosting was discussed a bit earlier. How do we associate data with, uh, with the mesh because it, if we're going to carry out operations like solution transfer, we need to uh, uh, support, uh, know that information. As mentioned, key surface, services are dynamic load balancing, mesh-to-mesh -mesh solution transfer, mesh optimization, and adaptation. 
there are two uh, uh, fast math implementations of a parallel mesh infrastructure, Sigma, which VJ is going to talk about, and Pumi. And uh, first, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the part pieces of this. The terminology we tend to use for a distributed mesh, and we can, uh, we'll blame Mark Miller for this, is that a lot of the common technology to say you have a partition in your partition, which of course, as he points out, doesn't make any sense. Uh, so we call the things on a particular node, if that's the level we partition to, a part. So the partition, is, uh, partition mesh is a set of, a set of parts. Uh, in the, the infrastructure, we can, tr we can treat the a single part is a serial mesh, or as we move forward on the, the many core systems, that we may be partitioning to the node, and then we're going to deal with what's on node still as a single part, but then maybe using coloring to do the open MP operations on that. Um, and I'm not going to discuss it today, but we actually have an example of that that is uh, coming hot off the presses to see uh, how well we can do those types of things. Um, if you do that, for supporting, if you will, the MPI level communications, which you're going to have from node to node, we need knowledge of the part boundaries and the ability to communicate from one part to the other when the mesh changes, when solution variables are updated, whenever we need to. And we need to be able to migrate the mesh, move mesh entities from one part to another and update the, the representations on the parts as well as the inner part representation with that. Read-only copies, uh, ghosting has been introduced. I'll just mention that within FastMath we defined a set of rules and uh, methodologies where you can support the ghosting of different dimension en entities. It might be the region, mesh regions, or in a solid case it may be mesh faces for some uh, reason, or it might be mesh vertices. We can ghost whatever we want. They can, what is ghost can be defined by a bridge entity. So it's, in this case, it's the mesh faces bridged both by edges. If it was mesh faces bridged by vertices, you'd see additional uh, mesh faces ghosted. And we can do it in multiple layers, support doing that in multiple layers. A couple of comments on mesh generation. Uh, we must be able to generate meshes on totally general co domains. We are dealing with meshes to this point. We're approaching 100 billion elements, and of course, that's just going to continue to grow. Uh, and we need, you know, if it isn't automatic, if you can't do this automatically, you're, uh, it's, you've got a bottleneck. Uh, so that our emphasis is on supporting fully automated techniques uh, to the greatest possible extent. Mesh adaptation must be able to use various forms of apoistoyer information to improve the mesh, be it discretization error control, be it the fact that you're doing an evolving geometry problem and you need to account for the mesh deformation, be it some combination of those, be it you're tracking a, a set of particles and you know you need a finer mesh where the particles are. Uh, we have examples of all those types. Um, and we want to support general anisotropic adaptation as well as some specific, and I'll, I'll be more clear on that when I show a couple of computational dynamics examples. Uh, mesh shape optimization, uh, depending on the discretization method, well, in all discretization methods, there is a, sen a degree of sensitivity to element shapes. Depending on the discretization method, the severity of that can be larger or smaller. So some some finite volume procedures can be very, very sensitive to element shapes in which we want to make sure we very strongly optimize them. Some other techniques such as stabilized finite elements would be less so, so we might take more liberties. But we have to be able to know what that is and then have the tools and methods to control that. Fields and solution transfer. So the fields are typically defined interpol as interpolations, be they continuous or discontinuous, and continuous to different levels or cross mesh entities between them. Uh, these fields are really tensors. We can define rules and regulations for how tensors interact, and of course how they tra do coordinate transformations and operations. Uh, we want to support operations, be they simple interrogation operations or basic integrations and, uh, and differentiations or more complex operations such as 
mesh-to-mesh -mesh transfer, and VJ will give you an example of, of how, how that can become more complex, and plus we can have constraints such as satisfying conservation requirements. So at this point, I would like to have VJ take over and describe the Sigma system to you. So what does Sigma stand for? Sigma is Scalable Interfaces for Geometry and Mesh-Based Applications. So it's a component-based uh, architecture, and we have a lot of different components to deal with uh, the geometry, the mesh generation, and handling, the, handling of the unstructured meshes itself. And there are also solver interfaces to hook up the unstructured mesh uh, data structures uh, seamlessly with you know, scalable solvers like Petsy. So first, the geometry engine is essentially called the common geometry module, which is CGM. It has several interfaces for solid geometry engines, uh, like ACES and Open Cascade. Uh, and MeshKit is essentially a, a toolkit that contains several mesh generation algorithms. And there are also several interfaces to external meshing, al meshing packages uh, that we can utilize underneath. And what MeshKit generates is a partition unstructured mesh database. And that's represented uh, by the Moab component. And I'll, I'll go over a lot of details of Moab as we go along the slides. I also want to mention here briefly about all of these different applications that are below. Uh, so Mark already showed some of the applications uh, in the initial slides. So most of these utilize Petsy or Trilinos as one of their solvers. And um, they use Moab as their primary unstructured mesh database for um, handling their discrete solvers. There's also a couple multi-physics uh, package that utilizes combinations of these different solvers that are MOAB-based and uses either Newton or Picard iterations to couple uh, different physics components together. And of course, there's a parallel I.O. with HTF5, and you can do in-situ visualization uh, through our native plugins with Visit and Paraview. So when I talked about computational workflow, what, what, did I, what do I mean by that? Uh, so first, you have a complex problem in mind. You know what PDE that you want to solve. So you have to define your geometry and define what your boundary conditions are specific to your par particular PDE problem or a couple PDE problem. Once you define that, you have to run it through some mesh generation algorithm, generate a mesh that's of high quality so that your PDE doesn't have a problem. Your PDE solvers don't have a problem. Once you have generated an unstructured mesh and you have a linkage with respect to the solvers, now you can actually go and solve your discrete PDE systems. Once you have that, then you can visualize, checkpoint, do maybe adjoint-based calculations, or maybe you want to refine back your original PDE model. So you can sort of iterate that, and that's, that's the computational workflow. And all the components in Sigma sort of aid you in different stages here. And as I mentioned, um, the mesh kit uh, is actually a graph-based design. So technically, you could actually replace any of the line generator or a triangular mesh generators with some other external package. And it gives you the ability to do uh, plug and play of different meshing algorithms. There are several interfaces. Uh, to MeshKit for mesh generation. There is an interface to Qubit from Sandia. There is NetGen, TedGen, and um, GMesh, which is GPL. Um, so next, I'll talk more specifically about the Moab Parallel Unstructured Mesh Database. So Moab is a completely array-based unstructured mesh data structure. So what do I mean by that is all the entities per partition are contiguous in memory. So it allows for a lot of optimizations in your solvers where you can make use of the contiguity in your uh, memory layout and perform optimal solvers there, even for the assembly. So we support both stencil and block structure computations. Uh, there is a, since Moab is a lot of set of low level APIs, uh, we do not, we ensure that uh, threat safety is preserved and so the utilizing code at the higher level, the PDE solver essentially um, can utilize either multi-threading or multi-core uh, functionality, either through, say, like ARCA or something else. 
and uh, you wouldn't have a problem. We have interfaces to Zoltan and Parmedis to do dynamic load balancing. There are also, we are also working on several discretization kernels which would allow either a user to utilize, say, uh, different type of basis functions for continuous galerican, discontinuous galerican, or spectral finite elements. There's also some initial support for generalized finite difference methods. And we are also working on an interface so that a user could provide his own discretization kernel that we can internally utilize to compute your uh, local operators in your PDE systems. And there is support for parallel uniform mesh generation. So once you have a coarse mesh that resolves the geometry that you care about, we could, do, we could load up the mesh in parallel, do uniform mesh refinements, which does a, a local reconstruction of the curved geometry while preserving, um, while minimizing the actual geometric errors. Of course, this is the case if you don't have the CAD models, where we have to do a local reconstruction. If you do have the CAD models, then we just project it directly onto the geometry interface. And we can do uniform refinement there. There is also initial work going on with adaptive mesh refinement. Uh, we're working on both conformal and non-conformal mesh refinements. So conformal refinement is sort of easy for simplices. It gets extremely complicated for quads and hexes mostly because once you refine a quad in a, let's say, a structured mesh, it's gonna propagate all the way through in both dimensions, and that's, that's a problem. It's not local anymore. So it's an ongoing research area there. Non-conformal with hanging nodes is easier um, in a lot of object-based mesh data structures, but it gets extremely tricky for array-based data structures, especially because of the uh, memory reallocation problems. So. Here's just an example of what I mean by uh, conformal, non-conformal. So assume in A you have the original mesh. If I want to do a non-conformal adapter refinement, then you can refine local regions of areas where, uh, say, let's say, the solution error is large. So you can resolve those areas pretty quickly. But for conformal, even if you want to refine a local piece of the region, uh, there is still a, a lot of propagation of the elements that has to happen. Uh, but the advantage here is that you don't have to do anything special or apply any constraints to your PDE solvers. You could still assemble your system equations as you would do normally. There are other mesh infrastructures uh, that are available in Moab. Uh, one specifically that I'm going to talk about today is um, searches, so point, point location searches. So this could be either based on uh, geometry or, um, yes. Actually, I want to know uh, if I'll give you a far mesh, could you cause the far mesh in parallel? Well, if we have the geometry, yes. If we don't have the geometry, there's. Have a mesh, don't have a geometry. Does, it, uh, does the original mesh resolve to some geometric curvilinear features? Right, but I just, uh, I want just uh, so we cannot start off with the mesh and then coarsen it right now. It's uh, extremely hard when you really think about it. Assuming you actually conform to some geometry, it's just hard to coarsen it directly without having no some knowledge of the geometry itself. If we do have the geometry, then I'm sure we can do something interesting there. So again, uh, Moab provides a lot of infrastructure to do uh, point, point queries. Uh, so this is especially important when you're doing couple multiphysics applications. Uh, you have solutions that are defined on different meshes, say uh, a donor and a target mesh, and you want to locate a point and evaluate the basis, the solution, at that particular point. So Moab provides, in parallel, a lot of very optimized query infra infrastructure uh, to alleviate all of these issues. There is also support for the discretization, that, as I mentioned before. Uh, we also have some smoothing algorithms. Um, and uh, the IEO scalability is especially a, a sort of a hard problem, even with the interfaces with HDF5, uh, just because of the nature of unstructured meshes. And the way you need to traverse that in parallel, it becomes extremely hard to scale in parallel. I'm going to talk more specifically, maybe a little bit in detail, about the solution transfer algorithm here. Um, so when I said we have optimized kernels for computing, uh, for locating a point, 
So here, the green mesh, so this green mesh represents a donor mesh where you have a solution already pre-computed. Now you want to project that solution onto a target mesh. And this could have completely different partitions. Uh, unfortunately, you can't see the elements in there. But this could have completely different partitions. They might not even be conformal in terms of either the partition or the element subdivisions. So what we do is we construct a, a KD tree uh, data structure where we find out bounding boxes of groups of elements that belong to a certain processor. And all, this data structure is preserved all through the different processors so that when you need to compute a point, you could just look, look at your local KD tree data structure and then make a point-to-point -point query. So that's what happens in the point location stage, where once you build the data structure, you can do the point location and you know you, can, you know the exact coordinate that you want to compute, and so you could make a request to the actual process that contains the bounding box. And once this process receives the query, it can actually compute the index of the element and then return that back to the, the original processor. So all of this is still the setup stage. That is, once you start your computation, you already know what are the points that you need to find and interpolate. And once you've done this, you already have the infrastructure to do the interpolation. So the interpolation stage, you already know exactly what element and what partition that you care about. Again, this is a point-to-point -point query where um, the target processor, the target mesh uh, processors actually query the source mesh processors for the exact point, uh, and the solution data is returned back. And then once this is done, we can, of course, apply different types of normalizations for uh, global conservation um, or conservation strategies here. So the crystal router is what takes care of all the different communication patterns. Essentially, it just aggregates all the requests and then sends, sends them out in chunks. So here's some scalability results on BGQ. Uh, we ran it up to 512,000 processors. Um, we got really good scalability. So the left, the left plot here shows the RMS error of the projection. The source, the donor mesh is the is a completely hex mesh. Um, I think we went up to 10,000 elements per rank, or actually, so that shows the different resolutions of the of the meshes, um, and the error is what we would expect as we refine the mesh on the both source and the target. We also found out uh, the scaling of the entire process of point location and the interpolation and. We got about 55% scalability on uh, 512,000 cores. And looking at the individual stages, we found out that um, the point location stage, which is the initial setup process, actually takes constant amount of time. This is because of the KD3 data structure itself. And we are trying to look at different types of data structures. So for example, the BVH or BIH trees to actually improve the time complexity here. In real world problems, you still have to think about the point location versus interpolation. So if your meshes are static, then you're going to do the point location once and interpolation multiple times. That is, you could do that n number of times per nonlinear step per time step. So you can think about this part that scales, which is the interpolation, which is in red. And that's what you're going to be repeating over and over. So basically, it gets amortized over multiple time steps. If you have moving meshes, uh, or if you're doing adaptivity, then uh, it brings in additional levels of complexity. But I'll leave it at that. The other fast math unstructured mesh infrastructure is referred to as PUMI. Um, it employs a uh, complete representation, which uh, I'm not going to go into the the detailed definitions of other than to indicate it's a representation that easily supports you changing the mesh in rather arbitrary ways, be it to collapse elements, swap elements, refine elements, do special localized meshing take techniques. And that information is related through to the what's on part and between parts with the partition model, which is basically uh, the methods that were described and outlined before. Um, the focus on the development of this method, uh, this infrastructure was to support adaptive calculations 
on evolving meshes either due to uh, changing the, me the mesh to control discretization error or to account for the evolution of the geometry or a combination of the both. Uh, we do, do this with, in combination with fully automated parallel mesh generation that can come from CAD Im information or other types of geometries. Um, and it's been linked in with multiple mesh adaptation technologies and tools, as well as multiple load balancing techniques. And we'll see a little of this in some of the application uh, uh, demonstrations. Over the past year or so, we have been working on supporting these technologies on the future architectures, making it architecture aware. Uh, one aspect of that was to put in a multiple level of the partition and not bother the user with that where the two levels of the partition is one would be message passing and the other would be a thread level although the user of the infrastructure doesn't know that uh, there's a tool called PCU that is differentiating what's on node using threads on node and using communication between nodes would be MPI this introduced reasonable memory savings uh, in that process. More recently, we have been uh, running these on phi types of systems, uh, in particular the Stampede system uh, and, uh, recent, and also Babbage, uh, in which the, the, we're using the phi accelerators there and not shown on the slide as of about two weeks ago. Uh, with the new re mesh representation we have, we are also doing, having capabilities working, a subset of our capabilities for doing mesh uh, adaptation, working on GPUs. Uh, mesh generation, we tend to use certain, uh, a variety of tools, but we, I'll mention uh, the, the Symmetrics mesh generator primarily because of the, the sophistication of it to be able to do things like boundary, anisotropic boundary layers, the fact that it automatically can generate a mesh in parallel to begin with. You don't have to start off with a serial mesh. Uh, it also supports having the geometry in parallel. We're doing problems for IBM where there's 500,000 geometric entities in the model, so we actually want to distribute the mesh. And they support higher order curve finite element mesh generation. Okay. So the, the goals of our mesh adaptation capabilities, the tool that we've developed, is to have that be as flexible as total remeshing in terms of what you can get in the meshing capabilities. That is, it does not require nested refinements per se. It supports coarsening of the mesh that you could start with a mesh of whatever fineness or coarseness you want. And you can make it much coarser. Many tools will only allow you to coarsen what you refined before. Um, so we can, things can be coarsened past what you start with. However, a very quick answer to your question is if you don't know where the geometry is and you ask to course in on something that happens to be on the boundary of the model, what do you do then? You lose knowledge of the boundary of the model. So you, that's why VJ was indicating you need that type of knowledge. If you have that type of knowledge, then you can track these things. Right? So the advantage of, of the techniques that we'll be demonstrating in the examples is it can support anisotropy, uh, including with uh, mixed meshes for boundary layers, et cetera. And it also, on the solution transfer, now if I'm doing a problem where I need to change the solution, I adapted the mesh, one could use general mesh to mesh transfer, but since the specific procedures are doing it incrementally, uh, piece at a time, we actually can do the solution transfer as we go along. That tends to be more stable and more computationally efficient when you're doing those types of mesh modification operations. Obviously, in other cases, you have general mesh to mesh transfer, and then you need a uh, tool such as Couple for that. But they're quite general. They deal with the fact that I have a real geometry. I go to that geometry. If going to that geometry turns things inside out, we fix everything. Um, and we have what's referred to as compound operators to really give us the same flexibility as if I'm doing a total remeshing of the model. We also have a field infrastructure that's tied to this. Uh, that field infrastructure is fully array-based. 
Um, oh, and I should mention that so is the, our mesh data structure. The original version of Pumi was a, a fully object-oriented one, but as we start going to accelerators uh, and more limited memory, we needed to create a version of it that was array-based. Uh, it's a different form of array-based than what's in Moab, uh, but it's very similar in overall performance. So now we uh, have uh, an array-based representation that does support modification within that, as well as Moab supports modification now also. So, so I mentioned local solution transfer, so this is just a picture indicating that. The comment I would make on that is that with certain operations, if I'm doing a refinement with no snapping to a boundary, then I have no problems with conservation or anything else because it's exact. If I'm doing a collapse operation, I keep, keep it local, so if I have to deal with a conservation issue, I can keep that to, to either strictly within the cavity of the mesh that was changed or within a small neighborhood surrounding that. Uh, technical details of why it might have to be a neighborhood is because if you're dealing with node-based variables, then that influences the neighborhood past just that cavity. Right, so the, adapt, the status of the mesh adaptation tools that we have, um, we've run them on very large meshes, 92 billion elements on three-quarter million cores running 3.1 million processes. Uh, with the, lo we, the local solution transfer is via callback, so you can put your own transfer operations in there. Um, and you can see a couple of pictures here. We do support anisotropy. A little hard to see, but on, in this case here, this is a boundary layer mesh where the me aspect ratios of elements right near here, and these happen to be uh, triangular prisms, are 10,000 to 1. That's on purpose. We want 10,000 to 1 because we're using a, uh, boundary layer theories within these in this particular calculation. Right? We can also support the adaptation of higher order curved meshes as demonstrated here. This is a real application of it. You just can't see that the meshes are curved in this in which the mesh is being adapted to track the particles moving through a linear accelerator. So a couple of highlights of some of these tools of the use of PUMI. Uh, M3DC1 is a higher order uh, MHD code, and in that particular case, we're using the mesh infrastructure not only to uh, support bringing in the mesh and its adaptation, but to support the full linkage of the mesh data and support the assembly of the PETSI matrices using the adjacency information we have, similar to what uh, uh, Vijay was alluding to in, in being able to coordinate to the analysis package. Similarly, with the uh, EPSI code, which is another fusion code there, the biggest thing they needed from us is to create some mesh generation capabilities. Now, it's a long story. The mesh generation capabilities we had to generate were easy to generate once we spent a year understanding what their constraints on mesh generation were. It, was, it, was a, it took a long time to translate between the statement of the physics requirements of their and com in combinations with their discretization methods and what that meant to the, the meshes they wanted. But once we understood that, then we could write the mesh generators necessary. And now instead of taking hours, they, do it in a few, they get meshes in a few minutes. Uh, we're working on extending that to, to uh, deal with uh, particle and cell methods and parallel meshes. Up to this point, their mesh has been small and serial. In terms of a, another application with ACE3P, which is a, a higher order uh, electromagnetics code, we support curved meshes on that up to fourth order elements at this point, and that'll be soon going to higher, arbitrarily high order, although realistically probably nothing past sixth is going to be needed. Right, so those are the, uh, the, the background on parallel mesh infrastructures and two specific implementations. Are there any questions on those particular topics for VJ and I? Because it'd probably be a good time to ask them. Yes. Can you expand a bit on the curved mesh capabilities? And can it propagate the curved boundary into the domain? Yes. We absolutely have to, because when we do curved boundary layers with elements with aspect ratios of 10,000 to 1, the next element in damn well better be curved also in a very similar way. Yes. And, and 
in our mesh adaptation, this is uh, we have a bunch of this in place, but we continue to do more work as part of the Compass uh, uh, SIDAC project. We actually want to have one of our mesh adaptation uh, capabilities, in addition to swaps, collapses, or repositioning nodes, reshaping mesh entities. And when you get to higher order, the the the, the maddening thing is ah. I can change or direction of curvature, so now I can deal with real coarse meshes because I start putting in a cubic, then you know, the fact that things really go all around, I can go around corners if I have to, at the equivalent of a corner, a rounded corner. So the next topic I'm going to be discussing will be dynamic load balancing. So the purpose, of course, as you're well aware, if I do these parallel calculations, I damn well better distribute my operations uh, uniformly across the system, and I better do it such that I minimize the communications required. Uh, so there's a set of tools that FastMath works on. The core tools, the main tools, are Zoltan and Zoltan II libraries developed uh, under the direction of Karen Devine at Sandia National Labs, um, which provide a number of tools. I'll also briefly mention Parma, which is a partition uh, improvement capability and the fact that uh, recently those two have been coupled and now Parma is available as part of Zoltan II. So what are we uh, going to be doing in dynamic load balancing? Well, you have some initialization of the application. You need to partition the data, uh, decide how you wish to partition. You need to move it around where you need it. You carry out your operations. Well, if we're in an adaptive loop of some form or a form where the load balance is changing by for whatever reason. It could be a fixed mesh, but I start doing more uh, multi-model uh, types of representations where in parts of the domain I have more sophisticated model. I now have workload and balance if I don't do something. So you reset, you do things like reset your weights or change your mesh, come back and do this operation. Well, if I'm going to be doing this several times, and we will be doing that in, several times in an adaptive workflow, I better do this fairly efficiently, uh, carrying out these operations. And I, you know, I need to do it such that I really minimize idle time of processors. You know, I'm changing from one operation to the other. That's not so trivial. I need to keep the interprocessor communications low. And, I, and part of that is keeping the redistribution of data costs l as low as possible. I may want to trade off a little how far I move things or which things get moved as opposed to perfect balance if I start have to remove everything everywhere because that's quite a price. Uh, for example, when we do something with Parma, we make the decisions to move it you know, in, a you know, in a small fraction of the time it takes to actually move stuff around if we end up moving a lot of it. So this is just contrasting uh, the, the difference between a, a static partitioning, uh, which you might do at the beginning of a process of a fixed mesh, fixed type of calculation on it, and a dynamic one in which you really need to run, uh, you know, this is side by side by with the application that is sort of uh, in an in-memory sense, if you will, it must be implement, must be parallel. Obviously, if I'm running a parallel application, I want to use that same parallel distribution to be working uh, and carrying out these operations. I want it fast, and I need it to scale. Um, I want, we want to interface to multiple such tools. It should be easy to implement, in, and you'd like to have incremental changes when those will be satisfactory in terms of allowing you to get the level of load balance you need with the communication control. So what is in Zoltan and Zoltan 2? Um, and I, uh, just a, very quickly, Zoltan 2 is the newer version of Zoltan. It is fully integrated into the Trilinos framework. It has some additional new interfaces in that, as well as a couple of new tools in that. Um, and there's one or two tools that haven't been brought in there that are part of Zoltan. But depending on your needs, you, should, you can look at both. Uh, but if you can use Zoltan 2, you want to be moving to Zoltan 2. Right, so the types of partitioners in there, there's geometrically based partitioners, there's space filling curves types of partitioning, and there's topologically based ones, graph based ones, which can be sort of uh, graphs of two types, typically differentiated a, a standard graph and hypergraphs where the hypergraph can account for additional types of connectivities, multiple edges connecting things uh, between nodes. 
right? Okay, so the geometric partitioners uh, are ones, these are the specific ones in there, recursive coordinate bisection or recursive inertial bisection. Uh, the a new one, the multi-section uh, method, which uh, was basically introduced to introduce some flexibility and additional speed in the process and space filling curves. The advantages of these methods, they're conceptually simple, they're fast and inexpensive to run, uh, they're effective uh, when you don't have something to, to help you define your graph. If I don't have connectivity information, what's next to what? I just have particles in space. If I just have particles in space, I know their coordinates. A geometric method's pretty easy. If I got to find connectivity, well, then, you know, maybe I got to do a double A meshing of it or something. Well, why, you know, why spend all that time if I have a graph-based partitioner that's satisfactory? Um, the space filling curves do a linear order, order and often improve cache performance. Their disadvantage is that they are not explicitly accounting for communication costs. And you do need geometric information, which depending, there, can, there are applications, not so much ones we're talking about for unstructured meshes, but other applications where you wouldn't have any geometric information. In unstructured meshes, we have our option. You could have geometric information, you have uh, connectivity information. So you can use either one of those. The topologically based partitioners uh, can minimize the data, data dependencies in there. Uh, you represent the data you wish to distribute as vertices in the graph or hypergraph and the dependencies of data on each other via edges in the graph. You get, can get high quality partitions with them. Uh, you can exploit control, uh, or ex excuse me, explicit control of communications. Um, and there's various tools available and I'm not going to go into the details of those. Uh, if we're talking about dynamic load balancing, we're going to be focusing on the parallel ones most, uh, uh, in most all cases. Their disadvantages are certainly more expensive than the geometric approaches, and they require explicit dependence information uh, be available for constructing the graph. So hierarchic partitioning in Zoltan, the idea there is to, uh, similar to what I mentioned on things we were doing with Pumi, uh, or excuse me, yeah, with, with uh, uh, Pumi is that in, in defining those partitions, we want to define them in two levels. You might want to account for the three levels shown here. What is your overall network? What are your node, what's on the node and what's on the core? What are your cores like? And with these things, by accounting for them uh, each locally, you can introduce substantial improvements over that. So here's an example. Uh, it's at a small number of parts run on Hopper, but using these new methods which explicitly uh, differentiate between first to the nodes and then to the cores on the nodes, you see some fairly substantial improvements in times. And you can see the, the sort of the effect on some of the, or well, these are some of the example matrices that these are working with. The tool referred to as PARMA, which is partitioning using the mesh adjacencies, Basically, what we want to do is see if we can account for, uh, well, initially, one thought is, well, you know, why construct a graph when I have all this mesh adjacency information already? That's really a graph. In fact, it's a more sophisticated graph, which has its advantage and disadvantage. Its advantage is because it's a multi-level graph, if you will, of different types of entities, I can account explicitly for the balancing and or communications of different types of mesh entities. And I'll show an example of why that's important in a minute. So I can avoid the graph construction. Now what its disadvantage that I'll get to is that there are not, you know, there's not some nice multi-level methods already available for executing it. So we tend to implement these with diffusive procedures and use them primarily for improving a partition for specific purposes, either because we did some local adaptation or because we want to account for more than one entity type to be balanced. The algorithms run in a specific order. Uh, the key only point I'll make here is that I can talk about whether I want the, to, the balance of, for example, mesh vertices to be more important than mesh regions, and I don't care about the balance of mesh edges. That'd be good for a linear finite element. For a, second order finite element, I'm going to want to worry about the vertices and edges first and, and the, the regions last. 
um, because of the, the two parts of the analysis, right? So in, in one, here's a, an application of it for a C0 linear finite element. There's two basic uh, uh, portions of the analysis we're concerned with. That is the formation of the element matrices and then their assembly and solution. And for the solution, what we're concerned about is the distribution of the mesh vertices. For the formation, it's the distribution of the elements. So we're going to run this and take what's given to us by a graph partitioner and say, ah, we see there's some spikes, there's some large imbalances in the number of vertices. We'll knock those down and we'll see that it is able to take an element imbalance uh, in, uh, well, uh, in this case for a large number of cores where the graph partitioners start having difficulties. I'm not going to go into the details, I don't have the time. Uh, but sometimes this actually gets a little worse. But here's the big one. We can have a very large imbalance in vertices and that's knocked down. Now, it may only be three or four parts that have that large imbalance. But as you are likely aware by now, being in this course all this week, is that it's the spikes, it's the high spikes I care about. I don't care about on a million processors if I got one doing nothing. What I care about is if I've got one that takes twice as much time as everybody else. Well, if I've got an 80% uh, vertex imbalance on a part, I basically got one that wants to take twice as long as the other guys, or the average anyway, right? Another thing that's important is the idea of predictive load balancing. That is, I'm going to do mesh adaptation. I actually, what we do is we will assign weights based on what the mesh size field is. The mesh size field is what I'm going to want to adapt to. I'm going to want to adapt to this mesh, which is, has a very fine anisotropic mesh at the, the lambda shock. Well, I'm going to assign the weights to this mesh, repartition that mesh, and then adapt. Why? Because I don't want to get this spike in elements on this part right, the part that was roughly right there. Uh, and run out of memory on, on that particular node, if you will. Right? So part of the application of dynamic load balancing is doing it uh, as in a predictive manner before you actually change the mesh. Finally, the partitioners are also of value for operations such as uh, achieving uh, uh, and maintaining scalability. So the uh, Zoltan 2 tools, the multi-jagged uh, geometric partitioner, has been used to improve scalabilities uh, uh, up to 524K cores for MULU. Um, Parma, as mentioned in the previous example, was used to improve things with, with uh, pasta. Uh, we do the predictive load balancing, and we've done multi-level, multi-method partitioning. Um, with more time, I'd, I'd go into it, but basically when you get to uh, hundreds of thousands of cores, the cost of graph partitioners and what they're going to take to get the job done uh, becomes, running them straight becomes problematic, so you do various combinations of things, and I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, also, the architectural wear capabilities of this, so this is an example where the uh, multi-jagged geometric partitioner has been used to map independent tasks to the nearby cores under t accounting for the actual connectivity of, of the computer of the uh, parallel system and introduces substantial efficiencies particularly as you get up to high core count as you see on the example to the right uh, over not accounting for that uh, so the next area is talking uh, about the unstructured mesh solver developments. And that is, we have these tools. We want to make sure we can have them interact very well with the solvers. So we want to integrate with them. So we're going to talk about two specific tools here. And both VJ and I are going to do these at the speed of light, uh, or as close to it as we can. I'll, I'll particularly go fast, because I just have a lot of examples there. Uh, for the Moab-based uh, uh, discretization manager and for work we're doing with POTS, uh, POST and PETSI as well as other applications which we've constructed adaptive loops for. So I'm going to talk about uh, the Moab-based discretization manager. Essentially, 
This goes hand in hand with uh, what Barry introduced earlier today um, about the DM object in Petsy. So what we did is create a, a specific implementation of the DM that utilizes the Moab unstructured mesh data structure underneath in order to handle all the complexities that come with uh, unstructured mesh-based solvers. So the original motivation was that we needed sort of a uniform interface to solve multi-component problems for unstructured meshes with various different discretization schemes. So if you can do unstructured meshes, then hopefully you can also do structured meshes. Not the stencil kind, but regular structured meshes. Um, so what we did was we created a uh, native Moab implementation that uses Moab for the mesh and uses Petsy for the scalable solvers. So kind of leverage both of those independent efforts where uh, there have been a lot of manuals invested in developing these codes. Um, so there is inherent capability to build sort of simple meshes in memory. So you could create st structured grids on unit cubes, for example, if you want to get started. Or you could actually load up arbitrarily partition unstructured grids from files that you've generated before. So this is not covering the mesh generation process, but actual uh, the PDE solver infrastructure itself. Uh, what it gives you is it gives you a mechanism and an infrastructure to analyze different kinds of unstructured mesh traversals uh, across your mesh. Um, so you could do, depending on whether you're doing finite difference or finite element, you could, you may be doing either vertex-based traversals or element-based, or for finite volume, you might be doing phase-based traversals. And again, coming back to the way Moab has been designed uh, to use contiguous data and memory, since it's an array-based data structure, you kind of can leverage a lot of that infrastructure when you're doing your PDE solvers based on this framework. So it sort of resembles um, what already exists. The, the two primary uh, DM interfaces, uh, the DMDA for structured and DMplex for unstructured. So if, you've, if you already have experience with Petsy, it kind of makes, gives you a jump start uh, to use DM Moab. Um, they support both strided and interleaved axes. So this uh, is specifically important for multi-component problems. Um, gives you options for different type of preconditioning. You could interleave uh, your degrees of freedom, your, multi your components, so that you can create some advanced strategies for preconditioners or use sort of the field split preconditioner in Petsy uh, to do um, optimized solvers. And the operator assemblies are dimension independent. So this again comes back to the low level APIs in Moab. So all the queries are dimension independent in terms of getting a connectivity or getting adjacencies of elements. Uh, you could do up and down adjacencies uh, if you want to query faces related to a particular element. So if you're doing DG based computation, you want to evaluate the faces and then compute adjacent elements or if you're doing generalized finite difference, you might want to query one ring neighbors or two ring neighbors of vertices. So all of those queries come uh, are exposed through the Moab because Moab actually implements them and exposed through low level APIs. Uh, there is also infrastructure in the Moab to define field components. Um, and it has the capability to associate mesh entities to the actual degrees of freedom in your discrete solvers. Um, there's a, another separate idea where there's this concept called Moab tags. Tags are essentially, again, contiguous in-memory representations of solution data. Well, it doesn't have to store just solution data. It could be arbitrary data. Store integers, uh, doubles, so that could represent maybe your material data or could be your actual solution that you're solving for. Once you actually serialize in terms of entities and associate your solution data with the mesh, uh, you, since Moab has been written with scalability in mind, the, um, the transfer of the solution in parallel, for example, ghost exchanges, uh, you get kind of free out of the box. 
you can also do this with the Petsy infrastructure using the local to global transformation. So it's just two different ways of doing the same thing. Um, so you get some sort of memory saving there. There's also specific functionality for allowing, for specifying local block fillings. So if you have a multi-component problem, maybe not all the components are coupled to every other component. So you can specify the actual coupling of your components and that the matrix allocation takes care of that. It takes that into account and then uh, allocates the memory needed for the discrete operators. Uh, you could also utilize all the uh, stiff components, the uh, ODE solvers for the um, stiff problems. Uh, so utilize either whatever is available already in Petsy or use sundials like uh, what Dan explained before. There are quite a few examples um, that use DMOAP. Uh, we are currently working on a geometric multigrid uh, functionality that utilizes the uniform mesh refinement hierarchy that I explained before in MOAP. Uh, I'm gonna be talking, or at least showcasing, two of these tomorrow in the hands-on session. Um, the rest of them are in separate branches that should hopefully get merged into Petsy. So there is, these are, again, simple examples, and we are planning to build more complex PDE systems based on this infrastructure. The, uh, another solver that has been part of uh, our developments is the PASTA solver, which is a CFD code that has been used for a variety of applications. I just quickly indicate this is a code that can deal with mixed anisotropic meshes with high degrees of anisotropy. Uh, it has been scaled to, uh, as indicated here, to over three million uh, uh, processes. Um, and it is a very effective. I'll be happy to answer more questions on that if anybody is interested in a CFD code with a bunch of turbulence models and a lot of other things in it. Uh, this is the pasta code is primarily the work of professors Ken Jansen at University of Colorado and on Karsani at RPI. Um, as part of our work that has been integrated with Petsy and uh, the initially the uh, the, the constant complexity of uh, when you're doing a, a something where you change the, where you have large meshes that come in that are partitioned one way and you need to assemble the matrix, there was the bottlenecks of, of uh, the assembly process, but Jed Brown, who may or may not want to describe it if anybody wants to ask him how he did it, uh, put some magic in Petsy and now the assembly process coming from our mesh data structures to map and construct the Petsy matrices is very fast. So now instead of having to use the native solver that was in there, we're able to use any of the Petsy solvers, which is becoming very important to us as we're moving this to some multi-physics problems where we need much more sophisticated preconditioners such as ones that are available to us in Petsy. This is where I'm going to go at the speed of light. Um, I'm going to mention the fact that we have used these technologies uh, the PUMI technologies, the mesh adaptation tools, PARMA, the symmetrics meshing tools to work with a whole variety of applications, DOE, uh, DOD, and industrial applications with multiple analysis engines to basically use the parallel mesh infrastructure that I've described previously to construct adaptive loops. This will be the only slide I'm going to spend any time on, but basically and sometimes there's uh, jokes made when an analysis person talks about this. Uh, we show a picture of what an analysis looks like and, and the, the real big box is the mesh infrastructure. But in reality, for the data flow, if you think about this from a high level of having physics and model parameters defined in terms of geometries, CAD models, for example, or image data, you need to have this infrastructure to go back and forth. Other pieces, of course, are mesh generation, error indication. <laughs> See, uh, you, uh, you know, the whole analysis package, I made the smallest box on the, on the picture pretty much. Um, and of course, visualization, et cetera. So with this, um, we have developed methodologies to be able to link with existing analysis codes with a minimum of code change. And anybody that's interested in that can talk to Cameron Smith, because he is the one that developed some of the specific tools for doing this. 
so that we avoid the transfer of information through files through the stepping through these various tools. And you can see that has quite a substantial improvement uh, as you increase the number of processors, file base becomes more and more of a penalty, whereas the in-memory, of course, improves, right? So some examples of this, Adap with, with the PASTA code, Hessian-based error estimators, which do anisotropic mesh adaptation, we have done problems such as active flow control problems where we have small piezoelectrics that are uh, influencing the, the flow. Uh, these are actually going to be put on real aircraft. Uh, I'll leave it at that, but they, we have basically large scale changes in geometry have to deal with and on problems with boundary layers and interacting boundary layers and lots of nastiness to this. Also applied to two-phase flow where you're going to adapt to the discretization errors and the evolving level set as you have this evolving geometry problem. For aerodynamic simulations of other types, we've integrated with the NASA Fun 3D code, again with the in-memory integration with these same types of tools to be able to do other types of aerodynamics problems. As mentioned earlier, for uh, working with the Slack people integrated with ACE3P to be able to do higher order curved meshes on these complex accelerator geometries. This is just showing that there's all sorts of geometry inside. It's not as simple as these, as indicated for the exterior for doing these electromagnetics analyses. What we will spend a little bit more time talking on, and Glenn Hansen is going to describe this in more detail, is recently we've been applying a variety of applications. I mentioned here structural analysis for integrated circuits, so it happens to be of interest to IBM, using the Albany Trilinos tools combined with these tools here. Um, so the, 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 this is some of the, well, one part I will mention is the, an interesting thing on this is that the model geometry comes from what's referred to as GDS2 files, which is only 2D layout file. So what the, our biggest bottleneck now is the fact that we have to generate our CAD model in serial. We have to figure out how to generate the CAD model in parallel because that's taking more time than the analysis takes. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how we're applying some of these unstructured mesh uh, capabilities that uh, Mark and VJ both introduced in the area of large-scale nonlinear analysis. So the tutorial tomorrow will involve the Albany code and we'll look at doing some coupled thermomechanical analysis using adaptive unstructured meshing on a fairly complex geometry problem. So uh, I'll introduce uh, Albany in more detail here in a moment, but I want to talk about just a quick summary. It's a general implicit multiphysics application. Uh, it's uh, multiphysics in the sense that there is a wide variety of capabilities that are in Albany that you can bring to bear on analysis problems. Those include large deformation mechanics, elasticity, plasticity, quantum electronics design, computational fluid dynamics, ice sheet modeling, atmosphere modeling, additive manufacturing, and even topology optimization. So uh, quite a bit of capabilities in this multi-physics tool. It also uses adaptive meshing pretty, pretty uh, extensively throughout a set of these applications. We're also starting up a new adaptive mesh application looking at reconnectivity ALE methods, arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian methods, to look at modeling ferroele uh, ferroelectric shock multiphysics problems. Instead of a classical AL method to where the mesh and the material move independently of each other, the mesh actually will move the material and we will deal with shear and deformation with mesh connectivity alone. So it's a kind of a novel approach at uh, how to move forward there with shock multiphysics. So what's Albany look like? Uh, Albany is a multiphysics application. It uses a bunch of libraries. It uses PUMI, as Mark discussed uh, earlier. It employs Trilinos for the solvers and uh, preconditioning, uncertain quantification capabilities, et cetera. Scalable linear algebra routines in Trilinos. And we're also using COCOS to allow us to give uh, performance on multiple different multi-core type of platforms. So we'll talk about that in the panel here a little bit later today. Uh, applications include ice sheet modeling, climate modeling, topology optimization, quantum electronics design, 
large deformation mechanics, semiconductor design, semiconductor manufacturing, and more. This is just meant to be Albany on a single slide. So a little more detail, what does it look like? What does a multi-physics application look like in general? You have meshing capabilities. In this case, Albany has dynamic load balancing, adaptive meshing, all brought in through the uh, Pumi, uh, uh, Pumi library. Uh, that feeds into a, uh, the intrepid uh, finite element discretization capabilities in Albany. Albany is really just a wrapper that takes a whole bunch of library capabilities in Trellinos and Cocos, and uh, again, Trellino solvers, nonlinear solvers, preconditioners, uncertainty quantification tools, wraps those all together to uh, solve, you know, complicated, moving, uh, uh, large deformation problems uh, of that sort. So, uh, quick structural overview of the code. One example is uh, ice sheet modeling. So uh, Albany, the Albany in instance that is used for ice sheet modeling is called Felix. And it's uh, basically a first order Stokes physics model that uh, models land ice flow over, uh, over continental surfaces. Uses a lot of capability at Trellinos. Uh, one of those is the scalable nonlinear uh, solver preconditioner stack called ML. That's another fast math, fast math product. Uh, this has uh, uh, done a lot of work with scalability. Uh, how the capabilities in Albany for ice sheet, ice sheet modeling scales to large number of degree, of, large number of degree of freedom problems, large core counts, both in strong scaling and weak scaling. We use a Knox nonlinear solver at Trellinos, and a lot of the code base that is uh, we're going to talk about today in, Pal, in PALS is uh, leveraged to do this ice sheet modeling. So PALS stands for parallel uh, Albany adaptive loop with SCORAC, which is the PUMI mesh database. That's the acronym there. So some of the detail here, uh, looking, at the, uh, looking at ice sheet modeling, ice sheet analysis. Uh, so uh, we have basically uh, some strong scalability results here on the Greenland ice sheet. And uh, looking at uh, the total time as we go from 1024 cores up to 16,384 cores. Uh, this is the Stokes model, the first order Stokes model in Felix, uh, hosted by Albany. So this is the total overall uh, performance of the, of the model. That includes uh, linear solver time in red, uh, finite element assembly time in black, and basically there's perfect scalability. So it does really very well uh, on this problem. Uh, let's look at the scalability of the AMG preconditioner. And this is looking at a little different model. Uh, this is a weak scaling plot. And we see that as we increase the core count, basically the amount of work is the, is the same as we go up. So that's what you really want to see. Just a slight increase, uh, so a decrease of efficiency as we get up here to the you know, 1024 cores. But by and large, this is a pretty good, pretty good performance. We're pretty happy with it. So uh, now we're moving into this regime of performance portability. What does that mean? Uh, basically, can we give, can, can we continue to scale uh, problems of this complexity on new architecture machines that involve uh, things outside of the MPI, the traditional MPI message passing type of communication protocols, uh, that involves the Intel Phi processors, uh, classic uh, Intel multi-core processors, and GPU processors. So uh, we're really interested in running, you know, tightly coupled multi-physics calculations on all of this hardware. So we're looking at uh, the different performance of a finite element assembly in a mini application, so it's basically a lightweight application that looks very specifically at uh, assembly, and we're seeing uh, how these different uh, algorithms perform on the different architectures. So this is our current uh, MPI, you know, serial uh, single core scalability here, and then as we're looking at the different platforms, so we're getting pretty good performance on the Intel Phi here, really a little better performance on the GPU, and we see though, however, that you want to have enough work on these architectures, so on the Intel Phi and the GPUs, you typically use a lot larger workset size. Workset is basically uh, the running uh, chunk size of the number of elements that you want to process in a single byte. So you'll typically use a larger workset size, and uh, but pretty good performance. We're fairly happy with that. So uh, talked a lot about uh, uh, application. We're going to really specifically start uh, hitting on large deformation mechanics here. The tutorial tomorrow will involve this. 
So uh, one uh, capability of Albany is looking at uh, modeling structural failure. This is an RPI suspension bracket here. We're looking at uh, mesh adaptivity and using mesh adaptivity as we get into a large deformation state to allow for accurate modeling of the elements as they tend to stretch under deformation. Another area that we're interested in is semiconductor modeling, looking at the modeling of stresses during a semiconductor manufacturing process. For example, uh, wafer construction. Wafers are typically deposited in multiple layers and multiple times, and you'll have metal substrates. You'll have uh, uh, basically silicon uh, material, ceramic material. And when you manufacture this and deposit these layers together and cool things down, you will have deformation formed due to the cooling process, different uh, rates of expansion and contraction as things warm up and cool down. So we're modeling the stresses, we're modeling creep, and uh, the mechanical and thermal behavior of these complex manufactured models. And that's done at Albany using the adaptive meshing capabilities of PUMI. <laughs>